In our current series, we've been listening to the words of John. The disciple John listened to Jesus. This is uh, Jesus whispering in John's ear, I think. Um, John watched Jesus live, watched him die. John was there. John was a witness of the resurrection. John was an eyewitness of Jesus. And kind of here he's being an ear witness as well. Through John, we hear the words of Jesus. And John says at the beginning of his letter, that's which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Now John's hearers, his listeners, are second generation Christians. People who hadn't met Jesus personally during his earthly ministry, but people who had met people who had met Jesus, so like, like John himself, so second generation. This letter is a letter that to, to a church that John considered himself part of, most likely one where he had personally converted or discipled many of the people in that church. John knew the recipients. He spoke with an assumed authority. This letter is a letter to believers. It's a letter of reassurance rather than criticism. It's been written just after a group of people had left that congregation. I'll be calling them believers when I refer to them this morning. And all through John's letter, he contrasts what believers had been saying and doing with what true Christians would be saying and doing. So our passage today begins at... Uh, Chapter 2, verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right and has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Hallelujah indeed. So, John refers to the readers of his letter as dear children. So in some sense, they may have actually been his spiritual children. But he's, he's referring to adults, not, not uh, those who are underage. Now, unlike John, I've not met Jesus personally. Except maybe once in a dream. I'm guessing that few of you have met Jesus personally. Has anybody here met Jesus personally? One or two people have. But most of us haven't, and, you know, that's quite rare. We haven't met Jesus yet. But you get that you will, right? Amen. You get that that's in your future. Have you ever wondered what it's going to be like? You have. Excellent. That's going to work very well. So, what's it going to be like? Those of you who have imagined it, what's it going to be like? When we see Jesus face to face, we are going to be aware of the wholeness of his love. There's going to be that look in his face, and there's going to be a knowing. Well, great. That's mine. Anybody else? What's it going to be like? What are you going to do? In it, she says something about, will I, will I dance? Will I sing when I see you face to face? Okay. Will I be able to stand at all? Yes. You know, the feeling of just being utterly overpowered well, by the isn't event. That the thing? <laughs> will you dance? Will you sing? Will you bow? before the King of Kings. H Helen Reed reckoned that the first thousand years she'd be just worshipping. Worshipping, okay. Lord, yeah. I can understand that. <laughs> Will you kneel before your master, before your teacher, before your rabbi? Will you throw yourself on your knees, face down, plead forgiveness for all the terrible things you've done? On that day, the books will be opened. It tells us this in Revelation 20. The books will be opened. The book of everything you ever did. It's all coming out. 
but also another book, the book of life. What John tells us here in his letter, that if we continue in him, we may be confident and unashamed before him. I guess I've always thought of myself as one of the three yourself on the ground types, but John is telling us that if we continue in him, we need have no fear, confident and unashamed before him. It gets better. Children of God. He says that we are children of God. And uh, oh, we've done those bits. And this is, this is something that John talks about in his gospel as well. He says that as many as received him, to them, that's us, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Pretty amazing stuff when you consider our prior record of wickedness. He takes us in like his own children. Gives a big hug. I'm hoping for a big hug. A big hug would be nice. Yep, Hilly's going to get a big hug as well. But are we like that? Maybe this is a bit more like we are when we're parents. When your children come to you, do they come to you fearfully, expecting judgment? Do they come to you expecting to be told off? When they want something from you, do your children plead and grovel and whine until they get what they want? Or, when your children come to you, do they climb into your lap, confident, with assurance of your love and acceptance for them? We all want good behavior from our children, no matter what age they are, whether they're little or whether they've grown up. But we as parents need to start with love. Because in the same way, God wants good behavior from all of us. He does, doesn't he? he this is like, oh, the scripture's full of it. And how does he start with us? Does he start like this? Or does he start like this? Jesus starts with love, doesn't he? Love comes first. Paul talks about this. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love comes first. God's love is not conditional on our behavior. We need to understand that. We need to be sure of that. We need to have a firm grip of that. God's love is not conditional on your behavior. God loved you while you were a sinner. All of those people out there. God loves them now even though they're still sinners. In the same way, our love for our children cannot be conditional on their good behavior. We need to be loving towards them, whether they've been good, whether they've been bad, whether they've been really, really bad. Now, any of you guys, any of you guys seen this face? Do you recognize this face? Have you seen it recently? Looks like she didn't get what she wanted. Looks like somebody, probably a guy, didn't do what he was meant to do. And now, this guy is not going to get any love in until he says sorry and does whatever it was he was supposed to have done in the first place. Anyone recognize this face? Any of you guys recognize this face? Yeah, all the girls are grinning, aren't they? Because actually, it's not just a girl thing, it's a boy thing as well. Guys sulk too. But you know what? Jesus doesn't seem to sulk, does he? We get told that he weeps. We get told that he prays. He tells jokes. He cooks John breakfast at one point. He's happy. He's sad. He does many things. But he never sulks, does he? His love to us is not conditional on a change in our behavior. Okay, let's get back to the passage. So, moving on then in the passage. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. 
Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And then the letter of the, t- the tone of the letter changes a bit. <clears throat> so John goes on, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him, that's Jesus of course, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. So what's John saying here? Is he saying that if you sin, you're not a Christian? Well, no, don't think he can be saying that because back at the beginning of chapter 2, like one chapter ago, oops, no, where have we gone? That's not right. So we see here at the beginning of chapter 2 that what John says is that doing right doing good is a consequence of following Jesus, of being a Christian. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, the truth not in him. But if anyone obeys the word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. What John is saying here is that doing good works, being a good person, is a consequence of being a Christian, not a prerequisite. Does that make sense? Being good is what comes after you're a Christian. Being a Christian makes you like that, rather than the other way around, where people seem to think that you have to do good things in order to become a Christian. So repentance and forgiveness comes first, then comes doing good. So, two errors and one truth. This is a bit tricky, so we're going to set it out to try and make it really obvious what's going on here. The first error is that thinking that being a good person makes you acceptable to God. This is kind of like the gospel of the naughty child. If you're good, I'll give you a sweetie. If you're bad, you're going to get sent to your room. Paul says, nope, that's not right. Paul says, by grace you are saved through faith. And this, it is the gift of God. It is not from works. Paul is very clear that being a good person, doing good works, is not what makes you a Christian. God's grace through faith is what makes you a Christian. Okay, so we're quite clear that that's an error. The second error, and this is the error actually that the people that were leaving the church that John was writing to, this is the error that they were making, this error number two, is to say, actually, if our sins are forgiven, we can do what we like now, because our sins are forgiven. And if we sin some more, he's only going to forgive us, so that's great. Yes, whoopee, we do what we like. It doesn't matter what we do. And, you know, we've we've heard before that in uh, the pagan civilization that, people like Peter and John were writing into, there wasn't really a conception of being a good person. If you did your sacrifices, you were good. But John now contrasts the position of real Christians with what these lever people had been saying. John says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seeds remain in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. John says real Christians will not 
carry on sinning. And this may have been one of the big deals that meant that these people had decided they had to leave the church. So what is the truth then? The truth is that being a good person is a consequence of God's renewing work in your life. John says, if anyone obeys his word, love for God, God's love is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Good works are our confidence and our assurance that we are truly saved. And it doesn't just work for us as well. Jesus said, and Matthew records the words, by their fruit you shall know them. Now Jesus at this point is talking about how to detect false prophets. How to detect people who are going to come in, tell you, look, tell you what you want to hear, and lots of people follow them. The way that you will know a person is a false prophet is by their actions, by the fruit of what they do. If people around them generally get happier and more godlike, that's probably a real prophet. If people around them generally get more miserable and less godlike, they're a false prophet. We don't get to judge other people, by the way, so we shouldn't use this verse as a license to go around deciding who's a Christian and who isn't. God gets to do that. So, what does John mean when he says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning? No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. It says a similar thing in there in verse 9. If the consequence of faith and redemption is a good life, then what do we make of these verses? Is it your experience as a Christian that you never sin? Is there anybody here who's a Christian and never sins? John certainly seems to be suggesting that's possible. But uh, by the looks on your faces, I'm seeing that your experience is similar to mine in that actually as a Christian, we do sometimes carry on sinning. Now, God, John might be exaggerating a bit to make his point, but I think there's something more going on there. He's already told us, John's already told us a little bit earlier in the letter, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John reminds us earlier in this letter that if we sin even as a Christian, that's not the end of the road. That Jesus intercedes on our behalf. So why does John speak so firmly about Christians not sinning. Anybody seen this movie? I think this is is, uh, Spartacus, I think, isn't it? Is that right? Hmm? Ben-Hur. Okay, I haven't got my my Charlton Heston movies wrong. Ben-Hur. He's a slave. And in chapter 8 of his gospel, John records what Jesus said about the slavery to sin. Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And then Jesus goes on to say, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is Jesus talking about himself saying, before you were a Christian, you were a slave to sin. But no longer. You are free now by the grace of God, through his son, Jesus Christ. This isn't a freedom to do anything you like, whatever you like, even bad things. This is a freedom from the slavery of sin. You now have the option to do good things. Whereas before, you were a slave to sin. You were pretty much tied to being sinning. But now, because you have been freed, you can now do good things as well. You don't have to sin anymore. You don't have to sin anymore. You're free. Andy, you're free. Alex, you don't have to sin anymore. Jenny, you're free. Are you free? Has the sun set you free? He set you free. Ron, you don't have to sin anymore. Cara, you are free. So are you, Michael.
Okay, moving on. In verse 11 of chapter 3, John now homes in on specific contrast between the behavior of the leavers, the people who've gone out, and the behavior of the Christians. Love one another. Heard it in the song that Paul kindly um, introduced us to earlier. Now, Jesus said this, at the beginning of his ministry, at the beginning of the church, he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. John records it in chapter 13, verse 35. Now, dear friends, what John is saying here, and he's echoing Jesus, is that the key characteristic, the defining characteristic of God's people is that they love one another. He's not talking about our church services. He's not talking about our fabulous kids groups. He's not talking about our evangelistic work. But this. Love one another. Jesus says, love one another. Jesus says, love one another. John goes on to explain a little bit more about this dichotomy, this separation between people who truly know God and the people that have gone out. He says, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now, when he talks about brothers and sisters, he's talking about his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking about the congregation, not people who are blood relatives like his brother James. He says... Do not be surprised if the world hates you. When the goodness of our lives shows up the sin of others in a harsh light, do not be surprised if some hate us for that. He talks about the example of Cain and Abel, where Abel was reckoned as righteous before God, and Cain got a bit ticked off about that and decided to kill him. And he did. He killed him. Now, you may not get murdered for your righteous life, but we know that some of our brothers and sisters in other countries actually do face that. But even here, if you're at work and all your colleagues pad their timesheets out and you don't, everybody gets shown up and you don't get to be popular. If everybody else sleeps around and you don't, maybe you won't be popular. Other people, many people these days say, all roads lead to God. And if you say, well, no, actually, there's only one way to God, you won't be popular. Some people are going to get mad at you just because we love one another and don't do as the world does. Towards the end here, John says, anyone who hates a brother and sister is a murderer. Seems a bit harsh. I don't know whether John's exaggerating for effect here. I don't know about you, but I don't find loving all you people easy some of the time. <laughs> Maybe some of you share that. I don't know. But Jesus had exactly this same perspective. This is Jesus talking as recorded by Matthew. Matthew. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. He's talking about the Ten Commandments here. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And then Jesus says, but I tell you, anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, apparently raka is a really rude word in Aramaic. I don't know what it means. Is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Huh. So, Jesus seems to think just like John, well, in fact, of course, he told John, the thoughts of your heart 
towards others are as important in terms of virtue or sin as your actual actions. If you're sitting there hating somebody, that's as bad if you went up to them and thumped them on the nose or stuck a knife in them. And we'll see also here again that harmonious relationships between the believers is an essential feature of the Christian community. So if you've got something against somebody in this room, Jesus says here that you need to go and deal with that. Actually, it says something slightly opposite. If you think somebody here has got something against you, you should go and deal with it, go and sort it out. Okay, last bit. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Christ laid down his life for us. This is how we know what love is. This is John's gospel again, echoing there, John 15, 13. No one has greater love than this. That one lays down his life for his friends. I mean, the main reference there is to Jesus on the cross. But actually, it's being referenced here as something that is an obligation on all of us. Now, I don't think any of you are going to get crucified on behalf of the rest of us. But actually laying down our lives in terms of spending our lives helping each other, that is what's being expected here. Talks again about brother and sister, people who are Christians. Actually, that's not just this congregation. This is a, this is a huge challenge to us when we see on the TV the situation that our brothers and sisters in other countries are facing, and those people are just as much of our brothers and sisters as the people you can see in this room or the people who are, you know, at the next church down the road in town. I think also we should be wary of just seeing this as money and things. I would encourage you to think about other ways in which you can love one another. Maybe you have a practical skill that you can teach somebody else. Maybe you have time which you could spend with somebody who is on their own. Have a think about what you have to share over and above just kind of money and stuff. So then, quick summary. We are children of God, confident and unashamed before him. He really loves us. We've seen that love is not conditional on behavior, if it's truly love. We've seen that good works are a consequence of faith and not a prerequisite. We have discovered, thanks to Juliet, that I am free from slavery to sin. And we have heard once again the, well, it's called a new commandment. When Jesus said it, it was new, but it's not new now, but hey, the commandment that isn't specifically there in the Ten Commandments, so it's kind of like a new commandment to us. Love one another. Now, in a moment, we're going to sing the song, A New Commandment, Love One Another, um, and that will be the end of the service. When we've sung the song, I would invite you to be quiet for a few moments, reflecting, and then we're done in here. There's drinks in the back hall, and do feel free to stay for fellowship. But first, I just want you to have a quick think about loving one another. What I want you to do is to have a think of two loving actions you can take in the coming week. One of those will be for somebody in this congregation. What loving thing, it's got to be an action really, it can't be just words or stuff because we were told it has to be actions in truth. A loving action that you can take for somebody in this congregation. And the other one is for somebody who is not in this congregation. Now, it might be somebody down the road in Catrum, or it might be somebody down the road in Cambodia. So, okay, two loving actions. One for a person here, one for a person somewhere else. It's got to be an action, okay? 
So, if the musicians would like to return, we're going to sing a new commandment. And as we sing, please meditate on the words and consider what your loving action is going to be this week.